The other day I was minding my own business, procrastinating from the work that I was definitely supposed to be doing, doom scrolling through social media, when all of a sudden up popped the trailer for the new Gladiator film. I loved the original and had completely forgotten they were in the process of making a sequel, so of course I clicked on it. And as I was treated to some dramatic shots of Paul Mescal and Pedro Pascal in their Roman attire, one particular clip really grabbed my attention. During what looked to be some kind of naval battle reenactment within the Colosseum, a gladiator is shot from a boat with an arrow and falls into the water, where he's swiftly consumed by what I'm pretty sure is a shark. That's a shark, right? Now, I know from watching the first Gladiator film, Ridley Scott did stay reasonably true to historical accuracy from the time, so I would presume that he'd stay reasonably true for the sequel. But I was asking myself, did the Romans really plonk sharks within their oval-shaped death pits to consume fallen gladiators? I'm no historian, so continuing on with my pure procrastination for the day, I clambered down the ancient history rabbit hole, and I couldn't quite believe what I discovered. I was led on a historical journey that took me from Rome all the way to ancient Hawaii, and today I'm going to take you on that very same journey. And together we're going to answer whether gladiators really did fight sharks in Colosseums. The ancient Romans were definitely penchants for the spectacle, some of which of course were the gladiatorial games. Some gladiators were volunteers, but most were slaves who were treated harshly, although they were given the opportunity to fight and die well in front of thousands of people. Gladiator battles ranged quite considerably in their format. Some were sword on sword combat, some were chariot battles, and some even involved animals. If you were a large land-based animal at the time, you were undoubtedly at risk of ending up in the Colosseum. Lions, tigers, rhinos, elephants, bears, and wolves were all transported from far-flung corners of the world to fight and die in amphitheaters across the Roman Empire. It's said that during one bout of gladiatorial games, somewhere between six and 11,000 animals were used over the space of 123 days, with the vast majority of them meeting their demise in the arena. So where do the sharks come into all of this? Because a shark isn't exactly going to perform well in a fighting arena where the terrain is wooden planks covered in sand. Well, every now and again, the Romans decided to really spice it up. For special occasions, game organizers would orchestrate naval battle reenactments, or normakias, which literally translates to naval combat. Considering the logistical challenge of organizing something like this, normakias normally took place in areas where there was already a body of water, like a lake or a river. But every now and again, they did import water into amphitheaters, and on at least one occasion, the famed Roman Colosseum housed a naval battle. As to exactly how they did it remains somewhat of a mystery, but most historians believe it was either filled via a giant diverted aqueduct or via the chambers and sleuth gates. What busy little bees they were. Busy little bees. Although in reality, it probably wasn't as deep as we think it was, with most believing the water to only reach about five feet deep. Because of this, they had to reconstruct miniature boats with flat undersides to ensure the vessels didn't just get stuck on the bottom. But within that flooded Colosseum, there are several accounts from different sources that state that sharks, crocodiles, and even hippos were imported and chucked in with the gladiators. Now, how on earth would they have got those sharks to the Colosseum in the first place? Well, pretty handily for those ancient Romans, the Colosseum and Rome sits fairly close to the sea in Italy. As the crow flies, Rome was about 20 miles inland from the coast, which opens out into the Tyrrhenian Sea and the rest of the Mediterranean Basin. Even more helpfully, the River Tiber runs slap bang through the center of Rome and actually passes just a few hundred meters away from the Colosseum itself, providing a direct route from the amphitheater to the sea. So it's likely that if sharks were indeed used, they'd have been caught out in the Mediterranean or just by the coasts and then brought on ships into the center of Rome. As to whether many of those sharks managed to survive the journey up the river, there's no way of knowing, but it does depend on the species. Some sharks are considerably more hardy than others and can deal with stresses a lot better. Smaller to medium-sized sharks would have probably fared the journey a bit better than some of the larger ones like tiger sharks or great whites. At the time, it's likely shark populations were considerably more numerable than they are today in the Mediterranean, so great whites and tiger sharks could have indeed been used if they survived the journey, of course. The Mediterranean was teeming with sharks back in the day, but over time, their populations have been truly decimated in this part of the world. If you did want to hear about sharks in the Med, particularly great white sharks, then make sure you check out that video in the top right, by the way. It's really cool, and I tell you exactly where you can find great white sharks in the Mediterranean. Overall, though, in terms of us knowing exactly what shark species the Romans used for these gladiator battles, there are no precise records that tell us. And this is where I ran into a little bit of a roadblock. Despite there being several 
accounts that sharks were placed in coliseums and amphitheaters for entertainment, the historical accuracy of gladiators actually fighting them is a bit sketchy. Again, I'm no historian, but I can't find any verified account of a Roman gladiator having a showdown with a shark during a games. So whether they were just put in there for the spectacle of it, or whether they were actually used for combat entertainment is a mystery. I can't really picture large sharks managing to survive well enough to take on a human in five feet of water, especially one of the big ones like a great white or a tiger. And then with those battle reenactments that took place in lakes or on rivers, most shark species aren't going to be able to survive in that freshwater environment anyway. So were gladiator shark battles just another embellished historical story? Well, I wasn't done there. Although I was pretty mad at Ridley Scott for perhaps jazzing up that section of Roman history, I was determined to find out more. Did other cultures ever use sharks for entertainment? One particular culture that I knew had a real affinity for sharks was the Polynesians. Sharks are revered within Hawaiian and Polynesian history, with many of their gods and idols depicted as sharks. These Polynesian shark gods were said to have different roles within their culture. Some of them protected the Polynesians from other sharks, some guided ships that were lost at sea back home, and some were said to control the amount of fish that fishermen could catch. It was even said that it was a shark that once guided Hawaii's first inhabitants to the islands. Most of these shark deities were considered to be guardians of the Polynesian people, and they were, and perhaps still are, culturally significant for this group of people. Particularly in Hawaii, sharks were considered to be the kings of the sea, and they were an animal to be feared and respected, but also admired as well. According to some Hawaiian historians, they were on occasion, though, used for entertainment purposes, just like the Romans did. Because sharks were considered to be gods, a human dying from a shark within a gladiatorial battle was classed as a great sacrifice. And long before the US Navy arrived with their warships, Pearl Harbor had a very different purpose. Because of its layout, Pearl Harbor was the perfect location to build large sea pens. One such pen is said to have been about four acres big, and large basalt rocks were used to create a sea gate that could be opened and closed on demand. Occasionally, those basalt gates would be opened and sharks would be lured into the sea pens with pieces of bloody meat. Some accounts even say that this was human meat, by the way. Once a shark, or even multiple sharks, had entered the pen, the gates were shut and the games could begin. According to Hawaiian historians, much like the Roman gladiators, some of them were volunteers searching for glory, others were criminals that were forced into the water to repent for their sins. The Hawaiian gladiators weren't forced to fight the sharks with just their fists, though. They were allowed a single weapon small wooden rod that terminated with a single shark tooth at one end. And the gladiator's aim was to use the shark tooth spear to try and cut the shark's underside and essentially disembowel it. Considering the geographical location, the gladiator sharks were almost certainly large tiger sharks. Hawaii is home to around 40 different shark species, but some of the main ones are tigers, scalloped hammerheads, gray reef sharks, and Galapagos sharks. There are, however, occasional great white shark sightings in this region of the world as well. And considering these gladiator battles involved large sharks that were aggressive enough to take on a human in a sea pen, they could on rare occasions have been great white sharks. But even if they were just tiger sharks, a pumped up large tiger shark is undoubtedly a formidable opponent. And because humans are not evolved to survive in water, you can imagine it didn't end well for the gladiators. Unsurprisingly, almost all of the fights ended with the shark winning, which according to the Hawaiian kings watching on was a good result as the human sacrifice kept the shark gods happy for another year. Every now and again though, one of the human gladiators did manage to best the shark, swimming underneath it as it lunged towards them and using their spear to gut the shark. As a result of their victory, they gained a high level of prestige, and some even believe the humans that won in these vicious battles had actually gained supernatural powers. The historical accounts for these Hawaiian gladiator shark battles are few and far between, and minimal evidence exists today. No one knows how long these fights had been taking place for, or when the last one was held in Pearl Harbor. But most historians believe the events were somewhat of a mixture between Roman gladiator battles and Spanish bullfighting. And they almost certainly were extremely culturally significant for the Hawaiian people and their rulers. Following the adoption of Christianity in the region in the early 1800s, many of the beliefs that Polynesians had about sharks broke down. And so traditions like these gladiator shark battles would have been lost as well. Many sharks that were previously protected by Polynesian kings began to be intensively fished, so much so that they nearly vanished from the waters where they were once so abundant. Only in the most remote and uninhabited locations of Polynesia have sharks remained at the numbers they likely once were. Thankfully, I came out of the rabbit hole with the answer that I was looking for. Sharks really were underwater opponents for gladiators, at least the ones in Polynesia anyway. I just find that an absolutely wild story, and hopefully you guys do as well. If you didn't, there's only one clip left for you. Are you not entertained? 
These days, though, we can obviously say that the whole concept of gladiator shark battles was pretty inhumane and cruel, but it is a fascinating piece of ancient history. And it tells us that sharks and humans have had complex relationships with each other for thousands and thousands of years. The complex relationships that we have with sharks has continued into modern day, but there's one section of humans that undoubtedly has the most complex relationship of all with sharks, and that's surfers. The dynamic between surfers and sharks is a really intriguing one, none more so than the surfers in San Diego. This part of the world sees surfers and great white sharks in real close proximity to each other all the time with little to no altercations. And in this video, I talk all about it. Why is it that surfers in San Diego don't have as many negative interactions with sharks compared to surfers in other parts of the world? So if you wanna find out the answer to that question, you're gonna find it in this video here. So make sure you give it a click.